Hey everyone. Give everyone a couple minutes to jump on. Oh my gosh, you guys. I've had a day. Um, I promised that we would do biscuits for um, our Friday related arts project. Hey, um, <laughs> today. Oh my gosh. First round did not go well. So today was totally a lesson in um, getting back on the horse and trying again. So um, I don't know what you went through in your Thursday today, but um, the biscuits challenged me. <laughs> My mom and sister always tease me a little bit because I like to make things healthier. Um, so part of that is I don't always have, like I don't keep bleach flour in the house and I don't have dairy milk in the house because I just don't eat or drink that normally. Um, so then when I went to make this recipe, I was like, oh, I'll just try it with what I've got. It resulted in hockey pucks which was <laughs> kind of fun. No, it wasn't. I got frustrated. It wasn't fun. Um, hey, um, so round two, I cleaned up my mess and I started over again and I got regular flour and regular milk and the second batch turned out awesome. And you know what I realized today? Dough is fun. I liked it. In fact, I will keep white flour in the house just because it was so much fun just making the dough. So, um, stay tuned for the instructions on how to make biscuits. Those will be coming, um, tonight or early tomorrow. So it was an experience. I learned a lot about myself. I compared the hard failed biscuits to life because sometimes experiences are just hard and challenging. Hey, um, and we don't want to try again because oh, this feels like it was a waste of time. It was a waste of energy. It didn't turn out the way it was supposed to. Ugh. And, you know, if I had approached it with that attitude of this sucks and I, I'm just done, I'm throwing in the towel, I wouldn't have experienced the joy of making a successful batch. Um, I really wish you could have seen me making the second batch of dough, though. It made me laugh and smile because it was so much fun. Um, so I would have missed out on a lot of things. And I thought, how many things in life do we go through? And we have that attitude of, I'm not going to do this again. I don't like to fail or that was too hard. And, you know, what do we miss out on when we choose not to try again? How could we have grown? How could we have learned? Um, and what's the joy in the journey and in the experience and the joy that we can experience on the other side? So all of that from <laughs> failed and successful biscuit making today. I don't know. Who knew? Hey, we got a couple people on here. So we will go ahead and get started reading. I hope you guys had a great day. Um, so... We're going to read Helping. We're still in Where the Sidewalk Ends by Shel Silverstein. And this is being read with permission from Harper Collins Publishing. Agatha Fry, she made a pie, and Christopher John helped bake it. Christopher John, he mowed the lawn, and Agatha Fry helped rake it. Zachary Zug took out the rug, and Jennifer Joy shake it. And Jennifer Joy, she made a toy, and Zachary Zug helped break it. And some kind of help is the kind of help that helping's all about. And some kind of help is the kind of help we all can do without. <laughs> oh, man. So we are going to continue in Treasure Island tonight um, by, or I guess the junior edition was... Um, condensed by Robert Louis Stevenson and then um or I guess the original version is by Robert Louis Stevenson it's condensed by Nancy Fletcher Bloom it's illustrated by Jerry Dillingham and Ezra Tucker and this is being read with permission from Dalmatian Press so if you recall last night where we left off 
Um, Captain, as he was referred to at the inn, Captain died, but not before he was given the black spot. And um, the innkeeper's wife and son, so the innkeeper died, and his wife and son were left in charge, and they um, escaped the inn just in time before the pirates came back to take what Captain owed them. When we reached Dr. Livesey's, the maid told us that the doctor had gone to Squire Trelawney's to dine. We rode to the grounds of the squire and were admitted warmly at the Grand Hall. A servant led us into the library where the two men sat on either side of a bright fire. The squire was a tall, stout man, over six feet high. He had a rough and ready face and a look that said he was better than others, or thought he was. Come in, Mr. Dance, he said. Good evening, Mr. Dance, said the doctor with a nod, and good evening to you, friend Jim. What good wind brings you here? Mr. Dance stood up straight and stiff and told the entire story. The two men hung on every word. When they heard how my mother went back to the inn, the squire cried, Bravo! And so, Jim, said the doctor, you have the thing that these pirates were after, have you? Here it is, sir, said I, and gave him the packet. The doctor looked it over, as if his fingers were itching to open it. Then he put it quietly in the pocket of his coat. Squire, said he, Mr. Dance, of course, must be off to his duties. I will keep Jim Hawkins here to sleep at my house. But first, he must eat. A cold meat pie was brought in, and I had a hearty supper, for I was as hungry as a hawk. While I ate, the squire and the doctor bid farewell to Mr. Dance and closed the door behind him. And now, squire, said the doctor, and now, Livesey, said the squire in the same breath. One at a time, one at a time, laughed Dr. Livesey. You have heard of this flint, I suppose. Heard of him, cried the squire. He was the most bloodthirsty pirate that sailed. Blackbeard was a child compared to Flint. But did he have any money? Asked the doctor. Money, cried the squire. That's all these villains lived for. Suppose that I have here in my pocket some clue to where Flint buried his treasure. Will that treasure amount to much? Amount, sir, cried the squire. It would amount to this. If we have the clue you talk about, I'll get a ship ready in Bristol Dock. I'll take you and Hawkins here along, and I'll have that treasure if I search a year. Very well, said the doctor. Now then, if Jim agrees to it, we'll open the packet. He laid it before him on the table. The bundle was sewn together, and the doctor cut the stitches with his medical scissors. It contained two things, a book and a sealed paper. First of all, we'll try the book, said the doctor. The squire and I peered over his shoulder as the doctor went through the book. It was filled with nearly 20 years of notes, dates, and strange markings. Here and there was a sum of money, along with several crosses and place names. Under the sum on the last page was written, Bones, his pile. I can't make head or tail of this, said the doctor. The thing is as clear as noonday, cried the squire. This is an account book. These crosses stand for the names of ships or towns that they sank or plundered. The added up figures are the scoundrel's share. Right you are, I believe, said the doctor, a thrifty man, not one to be cheated. And now, said the squire, for the other. The paper had been sealed in several places. The doctor opened the seals with great care. Sorry, I think I forgot to show you this picture. The doctor opened the seals with great care and there fell out the map of an island. It was clearly marked with latitude and longitude, water depth, names of hills and bays and inlets, everything that would be needed to find it and safely anchor a ship there. It was about nine miles long and five across. It had two fine harbors and a hill in the center part of, in the center part marked Spyglass Hill. There were three X's marked in red, 
two on the north part of the island, one in the southwest. Next to this last X were the words, bulk of treasure. Over on the back was written, tall tree, spyglass shoulder, bearing a point to the north of north, northeast, skeleton no! island. Sorry. Hey, stop. You're okay. Shh. <laughs> Come here. Sorry, guys. Neighbors are home. <laughs> Skeleton Island. East, southeast, and by east. Ten feet. Come here. The silver bars are in the north spot, near the east hill. Ten fathoms south of the black crag with the face on it. The weapons are easy to find in the sand hill. North point of North Inlet Cape. Bearing east and a quarter north. J. Flint. That was all, but it filled both men with delight. Livesy, said the squire, you will give up your medical practice at once. Tomorrow I start for Bristol. In three weeks' time, three weeks, two weeks, ten days, we'll have the best ship, sir, and the choicest crew in England. Hawkins shall come as cabin boy. You, Livesey, are ship's doctor. I am admiral. We'll take my servants, Red Roof, Joyce, and Hunter. We'll have a quick passage and no trouble finding the spot. And we'll have money to eat, to roll in, to play with ever after. Trelawney, said the doctor. I'll go with you, and so will Jim. There's only one man I'm afraid of. And who is that? cried the squire. Name the dog, sir. You, replied the doctor, for you cannot hold your tongue. We are not the only men who know of this map. These fellows who attacked the inn are after this map and the treasures. None of us should be alone until we get to sea. Jim and I shall stick together. In the meanwhile, you'll take Joyce and Hunter when you ride to Bristol. And from first to last, not one of us must breathe a word of what we have found. Livesy, returned the squire. You are always right. I promise I'll be as silent as a grave. I lived on at the Squire's Hall with Tom Redruth, the Squire's gamekeeper. Squire Trelawney was hard at work in Bristol finding a ship and a crew. Dr. Livesey had to go to London to find a doctor to take his place in the village. This all took longer than we had planned, and I often felt like a prisoner with old Red Ruth. My days were full of sea dreams, of strange islands and adventures. I thought about all the markings I could remember from the map. I would sit by the fire and picture that island. In my mind, I explored every part and climbed the tall hill called the Spyglass. Sometimes we fought with savages. Sometimes dangerous animals hunted us, but nothing I could dream up would ever be as strange or as awful as what our real adventures turned out to be. So the weeks passed on till one fine day, there came a letter from the squire. Red Ruth opened it and read it aloud. The squire had found a ship called the Hispaniola. She was at anchor, ready to sail. She weighed 200 tons. He wrote that his friend, Mr. Blandley, was very excited about our hunt for treasure. Oh, no, I said. The squire's been talking. The letter went on to say that he had hired a sea cook. His name was Long John Silver, and he had lost a leg while serving in the Royal Navy. This cook helped him find a good, tough crew of old salts. Mr. Blandley found out, found us a captain, a stiff man, but a good man. And Long John Silver found a first mate for us by the name of Mr. Arrow. The good ship Hispaniola was ready to sail. A few final notes. I was to go with Red Ruth and spend one night with my mother to say goodbye. Then we were all to come as soon as we could. Lastly, Mr. Blandley promised to send a search party if our ship did not return by August. Imagine my excitement. The next morning, Red Ruth and I set out for the Admiral Benbow. My mother was in good health and glad to see me. 
The inn had been repaired and painted thanks to the squire. He had even hired a boy to help my mother while I was gone. And this made me realize that I was truly going away. I had a few tears. The next day, I said goodbye to my mother and the cove where I had lived all of my life. I thought of the old captain, how he had walked this beach with his drooping hat and his brass spyglass. Then we were on our way. I dozed off in the coach. When I awoke, the day was breaking and we were in a large city, Bristol. We got out and walked down the street toward the docks where Mr. Trelawney was staying at an inn. We saw ships of all sizes and nations. Sailors were singing. Some were high overhead on ropes that looked like spider threads. I had lived by the shore all my life, but now I was truly near the sea. The smell of tar and salt was something new. I saw the most wonderful ships that had sailed the oceans. I saw old sailors with rings in their ears and whiskers curled in ringlets and pigtails. This was grander than seeing kings. And I was going to see myself to see in the Hispaniola with pigtailed singing sailors, to see bound for an unknown island and to seek for buried treasure. We came in front of a large inn and met Squire Trelawney, who was all smiles. He was dressed in blue like a sea officer. Here you are, he cried. And the doctor came last night from London. Bravo, the ship's crew is complete. Oh, sir, cried I, when do we sail? Sail, says he, we sail tomorrow. After breakfast, the squire gave me a note to take to Long John Silver. He said I would easily find his tavern, the spyglass, along the docks. It had a large brass telescope for a sign. I set off, overjoyed to see more of the ships and sailors. I made my way among a great crowd of people and carts, for the dock was now at its busiest, until I found the spyglass tavern. It was a clean, bright little place with neat red curtains and an open door. Inside were mostly seafaring men. They talked so loudly that I was almost afraid to enter. Then I saw a man come out of a side room. I was sure he must be Long John. His left leg was cut off close by the hip. Under the left shoulder, he carried a crutch. He did well with this crutch, cheerfully hopping about upon it like a bird as he moved among the tables. He was very tall and strong, with a face as big as a ham, plain and pale, but intelligent and smiling. He whistled and merrily gave a hearty slap on the shoulder to a few guests. Now to tell you the truth, when I first heard of Long John Silver, I was afraid that he might be that one-legged man whom the captain had feared. But now I knew this could not be that man. I knew what a pirate looked like. I had seen the captain and Black Dog and Blind Pew. This Long John Silver was pleasant and jolly, unlike those other miserable scoundrels. I plucked up courage at once and walked right up to the man. Mr. Silver, sir? I asked, holding out the note. Yes, my lad, said he. Such is my name, to be sure. And who may you be? Then he looked at the squire's letter and said quite loudly, Oh, I see. You're our new cabin boy. Pleased I am to see you. I shook his large, firm hand. Just then, one of the men at a back table rose and ran for the door. I noticed him and recognized him at once. It was the man missing two fingers who had first come to the Admiral Benbow. Oh, I cried. Stop him! It's Black Dog! I don't care two coppers who he is, cried Silver. He hasn't paid. Harry, run and catch him. One of the men near the door leaped up and ran after him. Who did you say he was? asked Silver. Black what? Dog, sir, said I. Didn't Squire Trelawney tell you about the pirates? That man was one of them. That's so, cried Silver. In my house? Then run and help Harry. One of those pirates, was he? Well, was that you sitting with him, Morgan? Step up here. Morgan, an old, gray-haired, dark-faced sailor, came slowly forward. Now, Morgan, said Silver very sternly, you never set eyes on that, er, 
black dog before, did you now? Not I, sir, said Morgan with a salute. You didn't know his name, did you? No, sir. Get back to your seat then. Well, let's see. Black dog? No, I don't know the name. Not I. Yet I kind of think I've... Yes, I've seen him. He used to come here with a blind beggar, he did. I knew that blind man too, I said. His name was Pew. It was, cried Silver. Pew. That were his name for certain. Ah, he looked a shark, he did. But Ben will run that black dog down. Silver went stumping up and down the tavern on his crutch, slapping tables with his hand. I began again to wonder about this man. After all, I had seen Black Dog in his tavern. The men came back with no Black Dog. Silver was very upset. See here, Hawkins, he said. What will Captain Tre <laughs> Sorry. What will Captain Trelawney think? Me with a pirate in my tavern? But I see you're a smart lad, smart as paint. You saw that we tried to catch him. Why, shiver me timbers, what could I do on this one leg of mine? I'll walk along with you and tell Trelawney the story. On our little walk to the inn along the docks, Silver told me interesting things about the different boats. He knew all about where they were going and what they were loading. He told me stories and taught me seafaring words and phrases. He was one of the best shipmates a lad could hope for. When we got to the inn, the squire and Dr. Livesey were seated together. Long John told the story of Black Dog in his tavern. That was how it were now, weren't it, Hawkins? He said now and again. The squire and the doctor both agreed that there was nothing more to be done about it. Long John took up his crutch and hobbled out the door. All hands on deck by four this afternoon, shouted the squire after him. Aye, aye, sir, cried the sea cook. Well, squire, said Dr. Livesey. This John Silver suits me. The man's a good sort, said the squire. And now, Hawkins, take your hat and we'll see the ship. The Hispaniola lay some way out. As we stepped aboard, we were met and saluted by the first mate, Mr. Arrow. He was a brown old sailor with earrings in his ears and a squint. He and Squire Trelawney were very friendly, but the squire did not like our ship's captain, Captain Smollett. Our captain was a sharp-looking man who seemed angry with everything on board. In a private meeting with the squire, the doctor, and me, the captain let us know his views. I don't like this cruise. I don't like the men. And I don't like my officer, Mr. Arrow. And there it is, the captain said. He went on to say that he should have selected his own men and did not like the rumors he was hearing from the sailors, that this was a voyage in search of treasure with a pirate's map to follow. I never told that to a soul, cried the squire. The men know it, sir, said the captain. I don't know who has this map, but I want it kept secret. From me and from the crew and from the first mate, Mr. Arrow. You don't like Mr. Arrow, asked the doctor. He's too friendly with the crew, and he stumbles about. I fear he drinks, sir. I am responsible for the ship's safety and the life of every man aboard of her. I will speak up when I fear trouble, for tis my duty, sir. Treasure cruises are never safe, sir. And with that, he took his leave. Trelawney, said the doctor, I believe you have two honest men on board with you. That captain and John Silver. Silver, if you like, cried the squire, but not that captain. He does not set well by me. Well, said the doctor, we shall see. We shall see. All that night we hustled about, loading and getting the ship ready to sail. I was dog tired. A little before dawn, the sailor sounded his pipe and the crew began to man the capstan bars, which means they started to bring up the anchor. Now, barbecue, give us a tune, cried one voice. The old tune, cried another. 
Aye, aye, mates, said Long John, who was standing by with his crutch under his arm. At once he sang out the tune and words I knew so well. Fifteen men on the dead man's chest, and then the whole crew joined in, yo ho ho and a bottle of rum. And at the last ho, they all pushed on the capstan bars, hauling the anchor up a little more each time. Soon the anchor was up and the sails began to fill. The Hispaniola had begun her voyage to the Isle of Treasure. The ship proved to be a good ship. The crew were able seamen, and the captain understood his business. But before we got to Treasure Island, two or three things happened, which I must record and make known. Mr. Arrow, first of all, turned out even worse than the captain had feared. No one listened to his orders. He was clumsy and sloppy, and it was thought he must be drunk. Nobody was surprised when one dark night he disappeared and was seen no more. Overboard, said the captain, shaking his head. Job Anderson was named new first mate. He watched our course and helped the captain, and the coxswain, the man who steered the ship, was Israel Hands. He was a wily old experienced sailor who could be trusted with almost anything. But my favorite of them all was Long John Silver. He was a good sea cook, and the men called him barbecue. He carried his crutch by a rope around his neck. This way, both hands were free for cooking. He kept his cook's galley as clean as a new pin. The dishes were always hung up. The dishes were always hanging up. In one corner was his parrot in a cage. He's no common man, that barbecue, said the coxswain to me. He's as brave as a lion. I've seen him grapple four men and knock their heads together. All the crew respected and even obeyed Long John Silver. He had a way of helping each man in some special way. Is anyone else starting to get suspicious of Long John Silver? Long John Silver was always kind to me and always glad to see me in the cook's galley. Come away, Hawkins, he would say. Come and have a yarn with John. You're young, Yar, but you're as smart as paint. I seen that when I set my eyes on you. I can talk to you like a man, my son. Sit you down and hear the news. Here is Cap'n Flint. I calls my parrot Cap'n Flint. After the famous buccaneer, Cap'n Flint was just saying our voyage will be a success. Wasn't you, Captain? And the parrot would say very quickly, pieces of eight, pieces of eight, pieces of eight. Now that bird, he would say, it's maybe 200 years old, Hawkins. They live forever, mostly. She sailed with pirates, she has. She's been to Madagascar and Malabar and Portobello. That's how she learned, pieces of eight. You've seen a mite of gold in your time, ain't you, Captain? Stand by to go about, the parrot would scream. The squire and Captain Smollett did not speak to each other much. The squire despised the captain. The captain admitted he liked the ship once it had set sail. Still, he muttered, but I don't like the crews. What I heard in the apple barrel. Every man on board seemed well content, and never was a ship's company so spoiled. Double grog was often served, and there was plum pudding every few days. Plus, we always had a huge barrel of apples on deck for anyone to help himself. Spoil the hands of ye make devils, that's my belief, the captain said to Dr. Livesey. Never knew good come of it. Never knew good come of it yet. But good did come of the apple barrel as you shall hear, for if it had not been for that, we might have all perished. This was how it came about. It was about the last day of our voyage. We were expecting to see Treasure Island late that night or early the next day. The Hispaniola rolled steadily. Everyone was in the bravest spirits because we were now so near an end of the first part of our adventure. Now, just after sundown, when all my work was over, I decided to have an apple. The huge apple barrel was nearly empty, so I just crawled over and into the barrel. 
I sat right down inside to enjoy an apple. I was so tired that the sound of the waters and the rocking movement of the ship put me nearly to sleep. I was jolted awake when a heavy man sat down close by. The barrel shook as he leaned his shoulders against it. I was just about to jump up when the man began to speak. It was Silver's voice. Before I had heard a dozen words, I would not have shown myself for all the world. Instead, I lay there, trembling and listening. Just from Silver's first few words, I realized that all the honest men on board were in danger. What I heard that night in the apple barrel chilled me to the bone. Long John Silver was telling one of the young sailors, Dick, about his pirating days. Flint was captain, he said. It was on the same plunder that old Pew lost his eyes that I lost this leg. But we got a lot of gold, we did. Ah, cried the young sailor. I hear he was the best, was Flint. Long John Silver went on to brag about his adventures. He said that most of Flint's old men were here, on the Hispaniola. He was trying to get poor Dick to join the pirates. You look here, Silver said. You're young, you are, but you're as smart as paint. I seen that. When I set my eyes on you, I'll talk to you like a man. You may imagine how I felt. These were the same words the villain had said to me. You'd make a fine gentleman of fortune, Dick, Silver went on. They lives rough and they risk hanging from the gallows, but they get gold, they do. Pounds and pounds of it. Ah, you may be sure of getting rich on old John's ship. Well, replied Dick. I didn't like the idea till I had this talk with you, John, but here's my hand. And a brave lad you are, answered Silver. They shook hands so heartily that the barrel shook, and a finer gentleman of fortune I never clapped my eyes on. By this time I understood that a gentleman of fortune was just a common pirate. Silver had Dick on his side now. Silver gave a little whistle, and a third man strolled up and sat down. Dick is with us, said Silver. Oh, I know Dick was smart, returned a voice. It was Israel Hands. He's no fool. When are we going to do him in, Barbecue? Here's the plan, men, said Silver. They've got the map, so we'll let this squire and doctor find the stuff and get it aboard. Then we'll finish with him at the island. But, asked Dick, shouldn't we just leave him on the island? Put him ashore and maroon him, said the sea cook rascal or cut them down. Dead men don't bite, said Israel Hands. Right you are, said Silver. I give my vote, death. Wait is what I say, but when the time comes, why, let her rip. But I claim Trelawney, he's mine. Then he added in a cheery voice, Dick, jump up like a sweet lad and get me an apple. Imagine my terror. I heard Dick begin to rise, and then almost at the same time, the voice of the lookout shouted, Land ho! Let's see, how much more do we have? We've got just a couple pages. We'll finish the chapter. There was a great rush of feet across the deck. I slipped out of that apple barrel and dived behind the foresail. No one had noticed. I ran for the open deck to look for the squire and the doctor. Everyone was staring out to sea. We saw an island with two low hills and a third and higher hill. The highest peak was buried in the fog. I heard Captain Smollett giving orders. It all seemed like a foggy dream, for I was still in terror from what I had just overheard. And now, men, said the captain, has any one of you ever seen that land ahead? I have, sir, said Silver, when I was a cook for a trader ship. That hill to the north they calls the Foremast Hill. The far south hill is... The mizzenmast hill. The highest in the middle they calls Spyglass Hill. There's a harbor just round it with a small island. Skeleton Island, they calls it, in the harbor cove. Thank you, my man, said Captain Smollett. I'll ask you later on to give us a help. You may go. I was surprised at how coolly John told of the island. A shudder went through when he laid his hand upon my arm. Ah, says he. 
This here is a sweet spot, this island, a sweet spot for a lad to get ashore on. You'll bathe and you'll climb trees and you'll hunt goats, you will. Why, it makes me young again. When you want to do a bit of exploring, you just ask old John and he'll give you snacks to take along. I found Captain Smollett, the squire, and Dr. Livesey talking together on the quarter deck. I whispered to the doctor, bring the captain and squire down to the cabin. I have terrible news. In the cabin, the squire said, now Hawkins, you have something to say? Speak up. I told the whole details of Silver's plans. Nobody interrupted me. They kept their eyes upon my face from first to last. Well, gentlemen, said the captain, we can't turn back. We must keep a bright lookout. The map shows a stockade with a blockhouse near the harbor. We'll hole up there and do our planning. We have the four of us, plus Trelawney's home servants, Red Ruth, Hunter, and Joyce. That makes seven against their 19, and there may be more that come to our side. Jim here, said the doctor, can help us more than anyone. The men are friendly with him. Jim is a noticing lad. Hawkins, I put great faith in you, added Squire Trelawney. Only seven against 19. And one of these seven was me, a boy. And with that, we will call it a night. So if you just wanted to hear the story, you can go ahead and sign off now. And I will see you back here tomorrow night, Friday night at 8 p.m. for the next installment of our book. Otherwise, I'm just going to close this in prayer really quick. God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for thank you for the time to just rest and to restore, to try new things, and even the opportunity to learn some life lessons in the midst of something so seemingly so simple and so mundane. I just thank you for all of these friends that have joined me to read the story. Thank you for the gift of their friendship. Thank you for the students and the families that I am blessed with. Please be with each of us. Go with us, guide us. Help us to have eyes and ears open so that we can see you in the midst of all the things that we're doing on our daily, um, in our daily tasks. Thank you for each and every one of these people. Bless them, guide them, be with them, and bring us safely back together tomorrow. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, you guys. Have a great night. I will see you all tomorrow. <laughs>